On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. But when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. And bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. I love reading these accounts of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And I have to admit that once you start studying it, it's quite confusing because each of them is slightly different. And um, you wonder whether somebody's got it wrong somewhere. Um, but I can assure you, um, I probably um, had my fears of any contradiction completely washed away by reading that um, Jewish Christian theologian, Arnold Fruchtenbaum. And he, um, in his book, a lovely book, um, Jesus the Messiah, has laid out uh, a, a complete um, outline of, of the events as they all happened in order. And I have to say, he really does make it extremely um, convincing that he's actually got it right. And um, I've been greatly blessed by reading his accounts um, From another source, um, we read there that the women went to the tomb. I don't quite know really what they were expecting to do. <laughs> because the stone, they imagined, would have still been in place. After all, it had been sealed at Pontius Pilate's instigation. And according to one source I read, um, contemporary source, by the way, that the stone would very likely have taken 20 men, strong men, to push it up that groove that it was set in before it was rolled down in front of the tomb mouth. So how they imagined a group of women would do what possibly 20 men were needed to do, I don't know. Were they going to sit outside and wait? until someone came along who could move the stone. I don't know. But um, they were so anxious to serve the Lord, weren't they, that um, they went there very early in that morning and were blessed by it. Well, now let's just 
come to prayer again. And I thank you, Father, for such a wonderful love of yours, which can reach down, and regardless of people's nationality, regardless of what race they are, that they might hear the gospel, the one redeeming gospel, and be brought out of death into your kingdom of light and eternity. Father, it may be that we take it for granted once we've been a Christian for a number of years, but we never should. Father, we bow before you tonight, remembering that there is one far greater than us who bowed his head and his body and his very life in obedience to the will of his Father in heaven. But Father, you were pleased with what he did. And by your Spirit, you raised him from the dead. And he's our Saviour. I thank you, Father, for the preacher that opened the gospel to me. I thank you for that man. And I thank you, Father, for the love and the care and the simplicity with which he brought the gospel to me. And maybe where you're sitting in the congregation, you can also be thanking God for the same thing. And Father, then, we've been Christians a number of years. And we thank you for keeping us. We thank you that this wasn't some passing fad, but that the Lord Jesus Christ, risen and glorified, is someone that we know personally. And we rejoice in him tonight. We praise you, Father, that we don't have a dead religion, but a living faith a living God. And Father, we thank you not only for the gospel, but we thank you for all the promises that are yet to come. For the promise of Jesus keeping to the end those he has saved, for his coming again, and for the even the new heaven and the new earth which will exist in righteousness instead of the miserable sin, torment, fracturization and grief of this present world. Something, Father, that we can barely even think of, not even in our happiest family get-togethers when everybody is at one and there's peace and harmony. But, Father, we praise you for our Lord and Saviour Jesus. Reach out tonight, Father, we pray. There are many, many people who will be still tonight proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ in this land. They won't be in pulpits necessarily, but all over the place. Someone will be sharing the gospel in a pub, maybe. Someone will be out in the park. Someone may be down at the seaside on a beach. Friends will be talking with each other. And people who have never heard the gospel before will be hearing it tonight. By your spirit, Father, please speak to others as you've spoken to us. And Father, may it truly be that we will bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ by our lives. Father, we thank you for our Sovereign, the Queen, even though she may be poorly and aged. We thank you for the stability that in many ways she brought to our land. And we thank you, Father, that despite all the changes of government, despite all the seemingly trivial opposition of 
government parties, that still you've given us peace here. And we pray that that will continue. Bring that peace, we ask, to Ukraine. Stop Putin, Father, in his tracks. We pray, Father God, that you will let the light of Christ shine. You have allowed this to happen. Father, sometimes we don't understand why, but when we look at the Old Testament and we see how you use terrible nations, frightening, fearful and mighty, to bring about your will, we believe this is part still, in some way that we don't understand, of your plan to accomplish all things. So, Father, hear our prayers Keep us in the faith to that end and in the joy of our Lord Jesus Christ. For his name's sake tonight. Amen. I suppose my text could have been one of many from the New Testament tonight, but I think that the uh, words of the angels to the women at the tomb is good enough, don't you? Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Now, do you ever apply your imagination to all the different people's responses and reactions to the resurrection of Jesus? I mean, can you imagine another gospel says that Mary Magdalene, she was the one who ran, ran to Peter and John to tell them, and her message was simply, they've taken him away. We don't know where they've laid him. There's no thought there of the resurrection, is there? Peter, ever impetuous, lumbers to his feet and races back to the tomb with, so we read in another gospel, his fellow John. And I can see them panting and poor old Peter trying to keep up with the slightly more athletic John. And John there stands by the tomb entrance he obviously sees the stone rolled away and Peter, puffing, puffing away like mad, goes straight in and he looks around. He doesn't believe his eyes, I don't think. And it says, he went away wondering to himself what had happened. That's Luke 24 and, and verse 12. I love the angels. How with that great heavenly certainty, they tell them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? You would expect the dead to be amongst the dead, wouldn't you? <coughs> And that's what the women had gone to see. Despite the huge stone over the gateway. But here, the stones rolled back. We're not told who did it. Not a, a, in this gospel. An angel rolled the stone back. But it didn't take long. It was very soon that every single one of those disciples, including Thomas, believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. After all, he appeared to them twice. He appeared to others as well. The scripture says that um, in, in the Jewish law, you need at least two witnesses. So Jesus appeared to someone quite different, like the two on the Emmaus Road, and they came back hastening to Jerusalem in order to be with the disciples and tell them and 
found that they were only concurring in what each one already knew, that Jesus had risen from the dead. And their knowledge that he was alive, of course, has changed our world. We know that. That great London preacher, C.H. Spurgeon, said this. I was quite surprised, actually, at the words he used. That if the resurrection had not happened, the whole movement would have fizzled out like a damp squib. I didn't know that they knew about damp squibs in Spurgeon's day. All the word fizzled out. But that's what he said. Of course, it had happened. And it's never been disproved. Can you imagine those Jewish leaders when the guard that was put on the tomb came to them? Still probably quaking with fear. Still stammering, hoping that each other, the others, would give an account of what had happened because they were scared to do it in case they got into trouble. And what did the Jewish authorities do? They bribe them. They give them money and they tell them that if anyone asks you, tell, tell them that somebody came along and stole the body. And from that moment onwards, those Jewish leaders knew, or at the very, very least, they suspected that Jesus had risen as he said he would. The Reverend John Stott, from, formerly from All Souls Langham Place, said, The silence of the Jewish leaders is an eloquent proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you know, twenty three years later, when the Apostle Paul was writing 1 Corinthians, he said this to those believers in that city Brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you. Uh, who did he receive it from, by the way? The Lord himself. He says quite specifically in scripture that it wasn't from other disciples, from other followers of Jesus, that he received the, the, the gospel that he preached. It was from God himself. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, then to the twelve, and after that to more than five hundred of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born." Of first importance, he said. By the way, just before I go on, he said to those Corinthian people, this is a sort of aside, I'm just putting this in. He said, by this gospel, you are saved. Now, in the 1800s, the 1850s, no one was ashamed in our country of talking about being saved. 
in the 1950s, there'd been a change. And when Billy Graham was over here, for example, it was, have you made your decision for Christ? Do you see the difference from the assertion and the assurance of being saved to having made a decision for Jesus Christ? And then here now, at the beginning of the 21st century, the key word is not saved any longer. It's not decision. It's, have you made a commitment to the Lord Jesus? Well, that's good to make an, a, a commitment to the Lord Jesus. Of course it is. But it's far more important to know that you're saved. <laughs> and I know that I'm speaking tonight to those who are saved. So I'm not preaching that part of the gospel initially at this moment that is calling you to salvation. But I know you are. But nonetheless, bear that in mind and don't be ashamed of the word you've got to be saved. Or as Brother Martin down here, his favourite key word is you must be born again. <laughs> Let's not be ashamed of those wonderful phrases. Going back to just a few days, of course, after... Um, those initial events from the resurrection of our Lord, the disciples were busy trying to choose a new disciple to take Judas's place. We find, of course, um, the story of this in Acts 1. Now, there were two conditions, weren't there, that they gave for this new um, apostle. One was that he had to be someone who had been with them the whole time that the Lord Jesus went in and out amongst us and the second qualification was they had to be a witness to the resurrection of Christ my aim is not to talk about that but to just show you again how important the resurrection of Jesus Christ was to the early church. And then just a few days later, on the day of Pentecost, Peter preaches to the crowd and says, God has raised this Jesus that he'd been talking about to life. And he says, we are all witnesses to this fact. And I was thrilled when I read that word in Scripture, in Acts 2.32. It was a fact. They'd passed on from any doubt whatsoever. This was a fact for them, as much as the day was the day and the night was the night, the resurrection of Jesus was fact. In the, the few moments that I've got, I want to bring three things very, very, very simply to you that I think are, are very important that come out of this understanding of the great fact that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And the first of these, well, I'll tell you what they all are. The first of them is that the resurrection was proof of the finished work of Jesus that he had accomplished what God wanted him to do. The second lesson I just want to leave with you tonight from this, and I'm not going into these deeply tonight, is that the resurrection was the commencement of Jesus' kingly and priestly ministry in heaven. And that's more important than we might think. He's not just an absent king. And third, that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead was the prelude to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, Jesus' representative amongst us on earth until he comes back again. 
So to the first of these, that the resurrection was a proof of Jesus' finished work. Jesus had come to do his Father's will. He'd come to bring God's light to a world in darkness, a spiritual darkness. He'd come to save the lost. He'd come to give his life as a ransom for many. And he'd come to destroy the devil's work. And he'd done all those things. In doing them, he had to go to the cross. He knew it from his early childhood when he began to learn the scriptures. And he saw that it was necessary for the Messiah to die. Something that the Jewish leaders didn't want to know. So their eyes couldn't see it. They liked their place. They didn't want another one being more important than them. But Jesus knew. And then when he became into his ministry, and he chose the twelve, it wasn't long before he was teaching them that he must die. At cruel hands, be crucified. And then on the third day, rise again from the dead. According to scripture, Jesus spoke seven times whilst he was on the cross. He may have spoken more than those. We don't know, but it's seven that um, the scripture gives. In the first of those, he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And then he goes through the various things that he said until we come to the sixth one. And in the sixth one, he says, it is finished. And according to John 19, verse 30, he bowed his head and dismissed his spirit. Note, he was in charge. The Jews thought they'd put a man to death. They didn't realise that it was God. Jesus asks for the forgiveness of these sinners, just as he asks for your my forgiveness. But he had to endure those six hours of sheer torment on the cross. On top of all the torment he had received from the hands of cruel men in those hours before. And then all the torment that he had had in the Garden of Gethsemane in prayer before that. And all the underlying torment that he had had as he was leading his disciples to Jerusalem for these dreadful events to take place. But in the end, he took a sip of that wine vinegar, just a sip, enough for him to be able to move his lips and say, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and he died. It is finished. Three words in the English language, in the Greek, of course, it's one word. To tell us die. And it's a word that was in common use in Israel at that time. If, for example, you were um, a slave or you were a servant and you had been given a job to do, when it was finished, you would go up to your boss and say, To tell us die, master. And we know that from lots of documents, not just from one or two, from lots of documents. They would just simply say, done. It's, it was quite strange, actually, because whilst I was preparing this, you might not think I do prepare, but I do. 
Andrea and I had been doing a jigsaw puzzle. We quite liked jigsaw puzzles, and after we finished our supper sometimes, we, we sit down and do a bit of a jigsaw puzzle. And we've just finished the hardest jigsaw puzzle I've ever done. One of a, a Lancaster bomber with its outside ripped off, showing you exactly how it's made. It's been terribly difficult. But being a magnanimous, magnanimous dad, loving his daughter, I allowed Andrea to put the very last piece in. And involuntarily, as she put it in with a hand like that, I can just see on the other side, I let her do it upside down, I do it the right way up. She put the piece in, and then she went, done. <laughs> she wasn't thinking of to tell us die at all. Done. And that's what Jesus' saving work has accomplished for you and me. His once and once only sacrifice to sin has opened the door for all those who believe in him. As someone said, God hasn't let Jesus pay the down payment and then we've got to finish off by paying all the instalments, which is what so many people believe today. Yes, they believe that Jesus died, but they still believe that you have to have a good record that God's going to be pleased with in order for you to get into heaven. It's not like that. He's done it. And all we have to do is to believe in him, to trust in him with all our hearts. He's paid it all. It is finished. Look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place, every year with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring um, salvation to those who are waiting for him. When no one's around, or I'm in the bath, I sing a song. I wait till that moment, because I haven't got a singing voice. But it's a song not in any of our hymn books, but it's called It Is Finished. And it just catches us. Just listen. There's a line that is drawn through the ages. On that line stands the old rugged cross. On that cross, a battle is raging for the gain of man's soul or its loss. On one side march the forces of evil, all the demons and the devils of hell. On the other, the angels of glory, and they meet on Golgotha's hill. The earth shakes with the force of the conflict. The sun refuses to shine. There hangs God's son in the balance. And then through the darkness, he cries. It is finished. It's finished. It's the end of the conflict. It's finished. And Jesus is Lord. If you don't know that song, you ought to hear it. It's good. It's good. The second of those things I'd like to bring you tonight is his heavenly ministry. The resurrection is the proof of his ability to go into heaven 
to do what God wanted him to do, that is, be its ruler and its king. Now, tonight is not the night for going into what his heavenly ministry entails, except for this one thing that I want to share with you briefly. Jesus has not forgotten you and me. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 to 11, we read that because of Jesus' obedience, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him a name above every name, that every knee should bow in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth. But that hasn't made him aloof. He still keeps you and me in mind. How do we know? In the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, we have the risen Lord's messages to the seven churches. And these are some of the things, not all, some of the things that he says. Listen. To one group he says, I've loved you. To another group he says, those I love, I rebuke. I discipline them. To another group, he said, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man opens the door, I will come into him and start with him. To another, he says, I've given them time to repent. To another, I know your afflictions. To another, I search the hearts and the minds, and to another, possibly doubting their faith, I will never blot his name out of the book of life. That's our Lord in heaven, still remembering us, still helping us. Paul wrote to Timothy and said to Timothy in 2.28, he said, the Lord knows those who love him. He still does. And for that reason, he's our advocate in heaven. An advocate means a helper. In law, they have advocates to help the client. Our advocate, says scripture, sympathizes with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. And so he sympathizes with us. He knows what we're going through. And this very day, probably this very hour, who knows, even now, he may be praying for me in the pulpit. That's how Jesus still thinks of us. He still wants to help us. You remember Nazanin Ratcliffe, don't you? That lady who was imprisoned in Iran for nearly six years. Great misjustice, we say. Her and her husband's greatest fear was that the foreign office of our country wasn't taking sufficient interest in her case. That they were going to let things be. That maybe she would become a, a good bargaining chip at some later date. They didn't care about her individually and her husband and her daughter and her own life. But they did, and once she was freed, they said so. We never have to say that about Jesus. He's there always for our aid and our help. He's our advocate. And when Satan rightly accuses us and says, well, look at Barry, he sinned again. Jesus will say, yes, but it's also forgiven again. When Satan comes along and tempts any one of us, Jesus is there saying, Satan, yes, you may be strong, but I'm his deliverer. I'm even stronger. And the Father will back Jesus up all the way. All Satan's accusations fall flat. May I just... I couldn't get this one out of my mind all week. That woman who was taken in adultery, you know, beginning of 
John 8 or John 9, is it? The one that some versions sort of miss out because it's not in the earliest manuscripts. What did that woman feel like when she was taken in adultery? When she was dragged from that very place to where Jesus was so that she could be a pawn in the game to try and get rid of Jesus, to some, find some fault in him. What terror she must have felt when she knew that the penalty for her sin was being stoned. And yet she comes to Jesus and Jesus stands beside her and looks at these fearsome men and says, and you, any one of you without sin, you be the first one to throw the stone at her. The woman must have looked at Jesus with awe, wonder, relief, thanksgiving, praise, and honour, and bow to him. And then he says to her, now go away, but don't sin anymore. That's what Jesus is saying to us from heaven. He's concerned about us. He wants us. He will never let us go. And then thirdly, and lastly, the resurrection of Jesus is the prelude to the ministry of the Holy Spirit on earth. If you read the Acts of the Apostles, you'll find a strange thing. At the beginning, the emphasis is upon the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, in the whole of the book of Acts, 23 times the resurrection of Jesus is mentioned. But the work of the Holy Spirit is mentioned 56 times. And in the New Testament, it's mentioned 260 times. Jesus went to heaven, but he said to his disciples, I will not leave you comfortless. The same word again, advocate. Parakletos. The advocate, one to help us, to be near us. To be with us. And Jesus said, I will come to you. I will send my spirit to you. And he shall be in you. And he shall teach you all things. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit is doing now. Herbert Lockyer, that great theologian, says, the Holy Spirit is the, the, one and only direct agent between heaven and earth in this age. We may pray, but it's the Holy Spirit who deals with our prayers. The Bible tells us that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing that the Lord will not let us go, that we will be his forever, for eternity. The Bible then tells those people who have been sealed that they have got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Every part of us filled. I can't tell you all the things that have been happening in our home just the last couple of days with the water system, but we've every now and again had to fill jugs with water. And uh, there's only one tap, was only one tap working. And how easy it is for you to walk away before you've filled the jug. Find you have to go back again. We've got to be filled so that there's no part of our life in any way at all that doesn't have the Holy Spirit himself working in us. He is the one who brings God's mind into our mind and God's life into our life. We can't do without the Holy Spirit. He is the one who opens hearts to God when the gospel is preached. He is the one who helps us grow in Christ day by day in our lives. He is the one who helps us in our infirmities. I've been in a place where I hardly have been able to pray. It's sometimes then that I've been most conscious of the work of the Holy Spirit. His are the fruit 
that we should be bearing in our lives. His are the gifts that we should be using in our ministry day by day. Praise God for the Holy Spirit. It may not be in the right time in closing my message tonight to bring you a, a touch of humour. But I think this is lovely. The church today is trying to be important. Did you see the Archbishop of Canterbury today? His message, his Easter Sunday message, is it's wrong to send illegal immigrants to Uganda. It's a bit against the nature of God. What utter tripe. Why isn't he preaching about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead? Why isn't he preaching about Christ in our lives? The church does all sorts of things to be with it, to try and make the church important in our day and age. So they will support Black Lives Matter. Or they will support, you know, racial harmony. Or they will support climate change. Or they will support this, that and the other and everything. In a much smaller way. One local vicar had the boys and girls in from the local secondary school into his church. And he was trying to make out and tell them how important it all was. And he went round everything. He went round the Baptist tree and told them about that, about the, the lectern, more about the lectern than the Bible, I expect. He, he pointed to the organ above him and the music, how we praise God. He went through everything that he could think of in his church. And they were all, you know, like children. Yes, 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 yes. And he ran out of things to say and suddenly he remembered his dog collar. He said, why do you think I wear this? And he blank, completely blank. And then one boy said, sir, it's to stop your fleas. He said, my mother says that on our dog... It'll work for up to five months to keep mites away. <laughs> Honestly, that's our church today. What we must do is to get back to preaching the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. What we must get back to is the assurance that he is alive in heaven and still loves us from there day by day and that one day he's coming back again to bring all things to himself. So, the three points. The resurrection is God's proof that through Jesus Christ, the gospel that you and I share is the only saving gospel for mankind, a finished work of God. Second, that Jesus Christ is the King of glory and there he has not forgotten us. And he's working day by day still for our good with prayers to his Father that we could hardly understand. Because he sees every need, knows everything about us. And finally, it's the proof that is the Holy Spirit's entrance into our lives. You know the Holy Spirit? Be filled with the Spirit. You leave here and go into work in this coming week, go with the Holy Spirit. Seek him day by day. Let him speak to you quietly, unhurriedly. And the Lord certainly will speak by his Spirit to us all. Praise God that those angels so long ago now said to the women, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He is not here. He's risen. Praise God. Amen.